I got it. Martin, sorry to interrupt you. Is your, is your mic on? It's not. <laughs> Thank you. Better, better. Oh, here we are. All right. So I don't have to yell too loud. Um, all right, that's a little disconcerting. Okay, so the Oral History Center uh, has been around since 1954. It was actually the second uh, oldest uh, oral history center in the United States, um, possibly the world. And um, it, so it was established in 1954, and since that time, our office has conducted over 4,000 interviews. Uh, each of these interviews runs anywhere from 90 minutes to over 40 hours in length. Um, so that means that we estimate we've done about 25,000 hours of interviews. Um, I wanna, I'm talking about this because I want to give you a plug, because I know that undergrads are often looking for uh, good, interesting, primary source material to use in their term papers. All of these interviews, all of the transcripts are available for free online. And so if you are studying anything about political history, the history of science, uh, the history of the California wine industry, we actually have a really amazing collection of interviews with some of the founders of the wine industry in California, um, go check out the Oral History Center website and um, you know, try to engage in, in, with these materials some. I think that you'll find it quite interesting. Um, so, whoa. Uh, okay, let me walk over here and avoid that. Hopefully, that'll be the last time I do that today. Um, all right, so today, uh, this presentation is uh, going to be a little bit different, I think, than what you guys are uh, learning about this semester, which I believe you're focused on globalization, right? Okay, so this is not about globalization. I'm not a globalization expert. Uh, this is a... Um, a talk that was planned for the fall uh, that unfortunately was postponed because of the tragic fires that hit our area. Um, so I was uh, happily invited back and given an opportunity to uh, give the presentation that was part of the uh, fall program on identity. So hence identity, empathy, and social change. Um, this is again the focus on the Freedom to Marry oral history project. Okay. In 2004, uh, then San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom began uh, issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Um, and you can see here the first couple uh, that were married uh, by, um, actually not by Gavin Newsom, but the first couple married that day were uh, Phyllis Lyon on the left and Del Martin on the right. They were uh, pioneers of the lesbian civil rights movement. Uh, they established uh, probably the first lesbian civil rights organization uh, in the country in San Francisco in 1955. Um, so here they are uh, getting married. I think that they said after the fact that they were just a little bit reluctant uh, to get married after being together over 50 years because this they really liked living in sin. Um, so, but here they are. It was a very touching moment. Uh, the marriage has lasted, I think, for about six weeks. Um, actually, several thousand couples got married. But as, uh, as his effort made its way into the courts, 
uh, the courts invalidated all of those marriages. And so those who got married, including uh, Dell and Phyllis, uh, their marriage was invalidated and they were again uh, unmarried by the state. Um, this inspired a whole round of legal challenges in the state of California. Uh, it's a very complex legal history, interesting to study, but I'm not gonna get into it here. Um, but these legal challenges challenged uh, uh, state initiatives that had been passed, I think in about uh, 2000, um, I think it was called Prop 22, that uh, officially defined marriage as between one man and one woman in the state of California. Um, that was eventually overturned uh, by the California State Supreme Court in June of 2008. And uh, sure enough, the marriages began again that summer. People called it the summer of, second summer of love in San Francisco, the summer of 2008. And uh, a few years older and a little, little worse for wear, uh, Dell and Phyllis were again the first couple uh, to be married in San Francisco. And here you can see uh, again then San Francisco Mayor uh, Gavin Newsom presiding over their marriage. Um, this marriage remained valid, wasn't invalidated, and uh, uh, Dell passed away shortly after this. Um, just a couple of months after that, um, just a couple of months after that, a uh, initiative, uh, this would have been in November of 2008, made its way to the California voters. There had been previously an initiative passed defining marriages between one man and one woman. This next initiative called Proposition 8, uh, you might remember it, in 2008, um, actually wrote that definition into the, U the California State Constitution. So that's the fundamental law of the, of the state of California, and it wrote this definition into it. Um, voters uh, had the opportunity to think about this. They had seen legal marriages happen throughout that summer. There was a very contentious and expensive uh, battle uh, that was waged in the state of California about whether you were anti-extension uh, of marriage to same-sex couples, in which case you were pro-Prop 8, or if you had the opposite uh, perspective on it. Keep in mind, this was also the exact same election uh, cycle when Barack Obama uh, was running for his first term as president. So let me show you some of the messaging. Uh, here is uh, California Senator Dianne Feinstein. Um, and she is uh, offering a anti-Prop 8 ad. So hopefully I can figure out how to work this. Senior Senator, there we go. Um, offering uh, maybe not the most robust uh, opposition to Prop 8 one could think of, but uh, she comes out and is very public uh, in her opposition to Prop 8. She says a couple things in there that I think are interesting to pay attention to. This is about discrimination, this is about constitution, this is about rights, this is about citizenship. It's not about marriage. Nope, don't worry about your kids, don't worry about marriage. This thing about marriage isn't really about marriage, it's about rights, okay? So this is the frame that the movement uh, that is arguing against Prop 8 is, is uh, engaged in. I get to the next one. I think I go over here. Yep. Okay, here's what the opposition, or actually the pro prop eight uh, side, uh, is offering up. Okay, can you see the difference here? What are they appealing to? This is not about rights. They're not talking about the Constitution. They're talking about the definition of marriage. They're talking about protecting your children. You know, Ask anyone who's on the fence about this, what are they gonna do? They've got a couple of kids, you know, they're not really paying that close attention to what's going on. What's, what's gonna appeal to them most? Possibly the ad about children, right? Um, and so, indeed, that's, that's basically what happens here. Ah, there we go. Uh, the vote uh, in November of 2008 was 52.25% in favor of Prop 8, 47.75% opposed to it. Um, most every county in Southern California voted in favor of it, I think, except Santa Barbara County. Um, Prop 8 passed, and the marriages that were happening that summer ceased. 
Uh, there was a great deal of anger and soul searching following this uh, victory of Prop 8. And I think that uh, it was a, a failure of a certain kind of politics, a certain kind of identity-based politics, and a certain kind of politics that we maybe have learned in the long history of uh, studying politics and social movements around protest about always appealing to rights and constitution uh, rather than issues that might be more personal and meaningful to people. And so basically what happens? Today I'm gonna talk about the um, the failure of Prop 8 and uh, other movements actually might come to mind, I think, or the failure of the battle against Prop 8. Uh, and I think it's time to rethink this identitarian framework for social change. That is, to move away from these arguments that my identity group deserves X and here is Y. Um, I think that we need to think about a new move uh, for progressive social change and um, to a potentially more effective model. And uh, what might that look like? Well, today I'm gonna to argue that those who really want to bring out effective and lasting progressive social change should perhaps sideline identity and rights and extend, instead uh, explore broader -ish ideas that uh, might do, le do more than simply preach to the choir and uh, rouse the troops. Um, new messages should be developed and messengers recruited that might have the power to shift public opinion uh, to convince those in the movable middle to support solutions uh, for a more just society. Um, I'll make this argument drawing from uh, the movement to grant the right uh, to marry to same-sex couples in the United States, and in particular, the Freedom to Marry Oral History Project upon which this talk is based. Um, okay, so... Between the crushing defeat uh, uh, caused by the passage of Prop 8 in 2008 and the Supreme Court decision of Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015, uh, and Obergefell v. Hodges was the Supreme Court decision, it was a 5-4 decision that uh, provided the national resolution uh, to the marriage debate. You might have come across the pretty remarkable uh, decision written by uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy on the issue. Um, between this period of time, something remarkable happened, and that was public opinion shift, shifted drastically from 60% opposed to extending marriage rights, 40% supporting, to the exact opposite. 60% supporting the extension of marriage rights to same-sex couples and only 40% uh, opposing it. That is a 40% shift, is that right? 20, <laughs> thank you. Um, that is a 20% shift in public opinion nationwide on a hot button social issue. This was a social issue that was definitive. It was, it was what drew the line. It was, it was how the line was established between if you were on the left or on the right. People on the right didn't support same-sex marriage. People on the left typically did. And it was that 20% that was kind of in the middle, right? Um, but we don't change opinions on hot button social issues in the United States very easily. And this happened. Um, so why and how did that happen? Well, this is the oral history project that attempted to document that and figure it out. Um, between September 2015 and December 2016, I conducted 23 interviews, uh, about 90 hours of interviews. Uh, all of those except two of those interviews are available online for you to look at the transcripts. Um, some were short interviews, two hours. Uh, some were mid-length mid interviews, five to six hours. And there were a couple of interviews that were quite long, over eight hours in length. Um, so who was interviewed for this project? Um, Mostly the leaders of the organization Freedom to Marry, which ended up becoming the national kind of campaign headquarters for this, for this movement. Uh, but also key leaders of the National Center for Lesbian Rights in San Francisco, uh, the ACLU, uh, which has a very robust uh, LGBT um, rights advocacy uh, element in it. Um, all of these folks were interviewed for this project, and there are actually a large number of people who maybe started out in NCLR, worked for uh, GLAAD, and then ended up at Freedom to Marry, so there's a lot of, a lot of overlap. Um, all of these were recorded on video, transcribed, and again, um, they're all available. Uh, on the website, and rather than confuse things, uh, this is the website, uh, and I'm not gonna click on through right now, but I'm gonna move on. 
Okay, so anger was predictable and palatable uh, in the immediate response uh, to the defeat uh, of marriage rights with the passage of Prop 8. There was a lot of accusation, Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, you know, the movement was really in a state of um, uh, despair and a state of infighting. There were a lot of accusations about what people should have done and they didn't do. Um, there were all new groups that were established to do what they thought that they should do. And there was a lot of anger being expressed publicly. And there were a lot of protests that were happening right after uh, the passage of Prop 8. And while the anger in these protests was understandable, um, the anger wasn't always expressed perhaps in the most productive ways. And here you see, I think these are mostly protests out in front of the um, Mormon temple in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the, the Mormon church had uh, underwritten a fair a portion of the pro Prop 8 movement. So, you know, it was a logical target for, um, a log logical target for the anger. Uh, and you, you have signs like, I don't need three wives, just one husband, um, kind of funny. Uh, but also, you know, uh, expressing anger at a specific target of a whole group of people. Um, not necessarily the best way to win those people who voted against you over to your side as these folks wanted to do, uh, you know, in a couple of election cycles when they hope to bring this before, uh, before the public again. Okay, so what then happens? Um, that's Kate Kendall, leader of one of these organizations that actually, she spent a lot of time on this campaign. What is she gonna do next? Um, the groups get together, uh, including organizations and leaders. Here's uh, Evan Wilson, who uh, was head of the um, uh, Freedom to Marry organization. Uh, he gets together with Kate Kendall and a bunch of other folks who've been working on these issues for a long time and say, all right, let's start over again. Let's figure out what we need to do to actually win these battles. And so basically what happens is uh, they move into uh, a realm where they start to figure out what is the code and how are they going to crack it. What were they up against though? 2008, right? So here is uh, presidential candidate Obama. This is in the months before uh, the election. Uh, this is before Prop 8 passes and this is before uh, Obama is elected. But what are they up against? So, all right, you have uh, the liberal Democratic candidate, uh, Barack Obama, expressing his opposition to same-sex marriage. Um, this, is, this, is what the, this is what the movement is up against. How do, you, how, do you get, how do you change people's minds? How do you get to even your core group of people, presumably? Uh, the task was large and, large and complicated. Uh, they had to convince those who were already friendly to gay and lesbian people that they then also needed to stand up for marriage. Um, so who were the people in this? Uh, I'm going to show you a video. I don't know. I'm not going to watch the whole thing because, uh, you know, we're already limited on time. Uh, but uh, the first person you see in this video is Thalia Zapatos. Uh, she worked in reproductive rights in the 1980s, um, but by the 1990s had transitioned to working on repealing anti-gay referendum. Uh, she was up in Oregon and there were a number of referendum being passed. Um, she's actually a, a straight woman who got into these issues because she saw a lot of her uh, gay friends around her, you know, being subject to these uh, discriminatory laws and, and she saw it as wrong and wanted to do something about it. We might see a little bit from Richard Carlbaum too, that's actually him. Uh, he, uh, he headed up the campaign in Minnesota. Uh, in 2012, Minnesota became one of the first states to, through referendum, uh, stop the, the anti-same-sex uh, marriage um, uh, legislation. So this is the process of them cracking the code. Okay, so I think that you're starting to get a picture there of what went into this. So. Social change uh, on the evening news looks fun, right? It's go out in the street, protest, put up signs, take the moral high ground, you know, go on Twitter, uh, say a few thing, mean things to people who oppose you, uh, and done. Social change happens. Actually, it's about research. It's about quantitative analysis. It's about sitting down and listening to the opinions of those people whose minds you need to change, not simply rallying the troops of people who are already in support of your cause, 
This is what happened post-2008 in the movement for extension of marriage to same-sex couples. Uh, the anger subsided, and the people who really cared about the issue got to work. And this is evidence of the work that they were doing during that period of time. So what are some of the messages here? What are some of the elements of this? Well, the message of love and commitment comes out. These are universal values. They're not going to a lot of people, uh, even opponents, saying that marriage is not about love and commitment. Um, two, uh, you start to get uh, the journey narrative in these things. That is, you start to uh, you know, feature people who change their minds about it, modeling behavior of, OK, I used to be opposed to marriage, but now I'm not. Um, and also, as you see, part of these uh, methods of changing minds, you're not, people aren't talking about, I went from a position of hate to a position of love. I went from a position of being a homophobe to a position of tolerance and understanding. No, you actually say that people um, retained their core values, believing that marriage is about love and commitment, and then they figured out how to apply those core values in a setting that might have changed their position on a particular policy issue, in this case, same-sex marriage. Uh, and then, uh, as you'll see in uh, an ad that I'm going to show you, you get unlikely messengers, um, people who you wouldn't necessarily expect to see uh, doing this kind of stuff. So I'm going to play this uh, short ad. For ad, right, to what Dianne Feinstein was saying just four years earlier. What Dianne Feinstein was what the movement thought needed to be said. It's what a lot of gay people were telling themselves uh, was the reason they wanted to get married to begin with. It was about, let's end discrimination and give me all the goodies that come with marriage. As this research happened, people actually started to realize in the movement that, you know what, that's not actually the reason we want to get married. Sure, uh, we don't want to be discriminated against, including we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, be forbidden the same kinds of rights and responsibilities that the rest of the, the community has. But they started to realize, actually, you know, marriage is something that we want personally. It's something that I want for myself and the person that I'm with. Uh, and that started to, you know, that combined with what was being heard in the message groups and uh, in, in, in polling and so forth, uh, combined and resulted in these kinds of ads. And these kinds of ads turned out to be extraordinarily successful because they resonated. They showed unlikely messengers. Here's a World War II vet, right? He's in his 90s. There's four generations of the family. Um, it's not centered on the, the lesbian or the gay man asking for rights or demanding their rights. It's the unlikely messenger who's saying, hey, you know, I probably wasn't like this, I wasn't, you know, this is new to me, but the more that I think about it, the more that I recognize uh, these, this movement uh, matches my core values. And so we need to adhere to those core values and extend marriage rights to same-sex couples. Um, so what happened in uh, Maine, actually, is um, Maine state legislature had passed marriage, extension of marriage to same-sex couples in 2010. Um, but in Maine, they have something called the people's veto. And before that went into effect, um, they had another vote, uh, a public referendum, and the public came out and voted against uh, that move by the state legislature to extend marriage rights. Uh, and so basically what happened was in 2012, just a year and a half later, they brought this back to the people. And so during that short period of time, they actually had to change thousands of people's minds in the state of Maine. And uh, in 2012, in fact, that happened. Um, so let's uh, move it forward again to I'll pass that one up. Okay. Uh, let's go back to uh, Obama, this is President Obama this time, 2012, spring of 2012, gearing up for the 2012 uh, re-election battle. And um, here is Obama um, rethinking his ideas about marriage. So in the span of four years, you see a vast cultural shift. You see a vast cultural shift in public opinion. You see a vast shift in policy by the nation's leading politician. 
And in fact, um, in 2012, you have a totally different result. There were four states in 2012 where marriage was on the ballot. Minnesota, Maine, Washington State, and Maryland. Maryland was the one big iffy one. That was the one where a lot of these organizations that were working on this uh, issue didn't put in a lot of money because the polling didn't look very good. Maryland has a, a large African American population, particularly in cities like Baltimore. The day after this happens, the shifting, the, the polls shift drastically, and Maryland, along with those three other states, uh, votes in a pro-same-sex marriage direction in 2012. Um, this was a necessary precursor to the Supreme Court of the United States ruling in Obergefell in 2015. You even nowadays hear uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's recognized as one of the most liberal justices on the Supreme Court, questioning the um, wisdom of the Roe versus Wade decision. The Roe versus Wade decision, of course, was the decision that made abortion legal across the United States. She doesn't question the wisdom of the law, of the decision. She believes that abortion should be legal and safe in the United States but she questioned the timing of that decision coming out. She thinks, and a lot of other people think this too, that there would have been a lot less cultural tumult following that decision if there had been more nationwide consensus on this. Um, and so the movement recognized that it would probably be many, many decades before you see uh, voters voting to legalize same-sex marriage in a place like uh, Alabama or Arkansas. Uh, the, the populace just wasn't there and you know you had sort of 70-30 kind of splits on the issue. So they all recognized that this issue would be resolved in the US Supreme Court. That was where it was going to happen. But the US Supreme Court, especially in the wake of decisions like Roe v. Wade, is a little less um, uh, ambitious to rule on hot button social issues in one direction or another unless they see that they are following the mood of the country and not leading the mood of the country. So uh, you get to 2015 when Obergefell is being argued before the Supreme Court. You already had uh, over half of the states in, in the United States at that point with same-sex marriage uh, being available to its population. You had 60% of the population in the United States supporting this issue. So at that point in time, that gave the US Supreme Court the space to be able to offer the Obergefell decision. And with very few isolated incidents of you know, refusal, the Kim Davis episode in, in Kentucky, um, with very few of those kinds of episodes, uh, this was a transformation that was accepted throughout the United States with very little resistance uh, because the mood of the nation had changed. And why did the mood of the nation change? Because the movement got to a point of recognizing that they needed to find out what the movable middle, uh, what, the, what the commonalities were with the movable middle and uh, what were the common values that would allow them to change their minds, not on their values, but on the subject uh, overall. So I think we're probably getting close to running out of time. I don't know if there's a, a moment for one question or two, but uh, we're, done. we're done. Okay.